Good morning, everyone. I hope you can hear me okay. Richard, I believe uh, you're on the call now as well. For those who are already on the call, can you, uh, I believe it's on the left hand side of your screen where the chat options are. Can you let me know that, uh, that you can hear me okay? Awesome. And while I'm waiting for confirmation from Richard that he's that he's on, um, I'd just like to say thank you to everybody for joining. This is our first one of the year, and we're using a new tool called Webinar Jam. Um, so it should be able to allow folks to play back um, on demand and we'll also be able to upload it to our YouTube channel and, uh, and other things. So um, a couple of you've reported back that the, the link um, where it says to go live for you all as attendees, I missed editing that. So we'll get that fixed for the next one. So any other little nuances or things like that that you see or note during this event, um, you know, please, please let us know via chat or you can jump on the Zeke Slack channel or you can send me an email, however you'd like to do that. Um, but let me let me introduce Richard. So for those who don't know Richard Baitlick, he is a, a strategist and author in residence at, at Corelight, but he's also a huge supporter um, of open source and Zeek and, and previously Bro. He was previously the chief strategy, chief security strategist at FireEye and Mandiant's chief security officer when FireEye acquired Mandiant in 2013. Um, at General Electric, General Electric, he served as the director of incident response and he built and led a 40 member uh, GE computer incident response team. Richard began his uh, digital security career as a military intelligence officer in 1997 uh, in the Air Force at their uh, computer emergency response team. Uh, Air Force uh, Warfare Center, uh, Information Warfare Center, and the Air Force Intelligence Agency. Rich is a graduate of Harvard University and the United States Air Force Academy, and he has authored, co-authored, and contributed over a dozen books. Um, he also writes for his blog, which is Tau Security at blogspot.com and Twitter. So you'll see him all over the place. Um, and Richard, um, with that, um, I guess uh, I guess you can take it over. Uh, we can see your screen uh, and well, we can see, uh, we see your picture right now. So I think if you uh, turn your screen share on, uh, you should, which is, should be at the top of the page, you should be able to start sharing your screen. And for those who haven't seen it, there's also a poll. If you could fill that poll out while we're getting um, started. Appreciate everyone's patience as we work through this. Sure. 
Um, I think. Let me. <clears throat> One second, folks. We'll be getting started in just a minute. Just getting everything set up. I, if anybody has uh, questions or you uh, you um, can share either in the chat, can you share like what you're wanting to get out of today's session? Any questions you may already have, um, you know, for Richard, we can go ahead and stack them up uh, in uh, in the chat. Um, we're, he's going to be joining shortly. We have about four of these already set up, and uh, it's very easy to uh, um, it, it, it's very easy to join the, the 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 one that's for later on in the month. And Richard has joined us now. Um, Richard, wow. now, that, now that yeah, you're I am here. sorry about that. The uh, I was in a room by myself, feeling uh, you know, with all my friends. <laughs> I, you know what? I understand that feeling. So with that. Uh, I introduced you earlier via your bio, though I'm not English you very well this morning. Um, but uh, I'll let you take it over, and I am going to mute my audio. And if you'd like to recap your bio for everybody, um, I, I went through it. But if you'd like to recap it, and I've asked folks to take the poll and to go ahead and um, any questions they may have before even hearing the presentation or what they're expecting to get out of this session to go ahead and stack those up in chat. Uh, so you could sort of be aware of them as you're, you're going through your presentation. And with that, the floor is yours. All right. Thank you. Just a note on this interface. I can't see people's questions um, while I'm presenting. So I'll probably just pause at intervals and check out what's going on. Um, but thanks for the introduction, Amber. Uh, my name is Richard Baitlick. I've been with Corelight now for about uh, two and a half years. And I began my journey with Zeke back in um, 2003 when I was writing my first book. And someone said, hey, you really need to check out this software called Bro. Um, I was using other software that had um, similar but a little bit more limited capabilities as far as uh, creating session or transaction logs. and uh, I tried it. It was very difficult to get working. I, I put it aside for several years. I returned to it in 2007 when a friend of mine in Singapore said, hey, you should really take a second look at Bro. They've made some improvements with version 121. And I, I wrote about it a little bit on my blog, but I don't think it really stuck with me as far as being something that I could really use in production until I went to the uh, one of the first or probably if not the first public training events that uh, was conducted by Vern and Seth and Robin and Christian and a few other people. And uh, that changed, that, that made it all, all the more relevant for me. And I rewrote my um, TCP IP weapon school classes around using uh, then bro, now Zeke. So I've been using it for a while. And one of the, uh, one of the, well, this, this issue sort of cuts both ways. One of the best things and probably one of the more challenging aspects of the Zeke project is the documentation. The documentation is very, uh, thorough. So there's a lot of material there. But uh, I am not a programmer. My programming expertise extends to essentially writing for loops in bash in order to iterate over files and to do other uh, simple command line tasks. So when I approach documentation for a project like Zeek, I'm basically looking for how do I use this? What do I get out of it? And I try to bring a beginner's mind to that topic. So if I were someone who Maybe I was told here is data in Zeek format, or I was told here is a Zeek deployment and make sense of what we have here, or whatever sort of um, first steps on the journey with Zeek. 
if I were in that position, what would I find when I came to the documentation? And what I found was that the documentation seemed to be written more from a programmer's point of view. And there's nothing wrong with that if you're a programmer and you want to do programmer type activities. But if you're a new person, or especially uh, if you're more of an analyst, so you're someone who's working with the data, I didn't find that there was uh, a lot of material there to sort of help you understand um, how to use it. And that was a shame, in my opinion, because uh, Zeek is such a powerful uh, tool that if people aren't using it simply because they're not sure how to work with the data, you know, that's that seems like a problem that we should we should fix. So uh, early last year, I uh, basically pitched my my boss, um, Greg uh, Bell from Corelight, and I said I'd like to take on a rewrite of the Zeek documentation. And there had been discussions for many years about doing some kind of book of Zeek, something to that effect. And uh, I had been inspired by my involvement, uh, you know, limited as it is, but uh, with the Security Onion project. And I always appreciated how their documentation was very uh, beginner friendly, very user friendly, and uh, also very thorough. And uh, they host their documentation on Read the Docs, and Zeek hosts its documentation on Read the Docs. And uh, one of the aspects of Security Onion that I like is that they convert uh, their documentation into a printed book. So people who work in uh, secure environments, uh, places that have uh, air gap networks or are supposed to have air gap networks, they can take a hard copy of the documentation with them and they can read it and they can use it to interpret what they're seeing uh, as necessary. So I thought that. That, that there's some good examples there about uh, what we could possibly do with with Zeek documentation. And finally, as far as inspiration goes, I've uh, I used to use FreeBSD. I I was a huge FreeBSD advocate. I used it for many years. Uh, eventually turned to Linux, like so many of us have. But I was always impressed by the thorough aspects of the FreeBSD documentation. And so when I put all those those things together, I thought, let me see what we could do with Zeek documentation. So what I have on the screen here is the, we'll, we'll call this the old version of, uh, well, actually this is, let me just do this here. Let's go to the bottom of the screen here. And we're gonna go to what's listed as current. This is the documentation as it uh, was before I started working with it. And there's different versions of Zeek and there's different versions of the documentation. And to be honest, this is one of the areas that I'm still confused about and I'm still trying to work my way through. Um, Zeek has, well, Zeek has adopted some new models as ter uh, in terms of having a long-term support version and a version that has the latest releases. And my I, one of the ideas that I have for the, the documentation is that eventually perhaps we could have, um, for the material that's written by a human, there would be one version. And then for the material that's generated from the Zeek source code, there would be um, several versions. We're not there yet. We're, we've just started this journey. But if you were to have checked out the Zeek documentation uh, a year ago, it would have looked like this. You had an introduction. We'll just start looking at some of this material. Um, so it talks about features and analysis and has a history slide. And then after the introduction, it immediately goes into cluster architecture. Now, clustering is important. It's actually one of the cooler aspects of what Zeek can do. But I don't know if a, a newcomer to the project would even necessarily care about cluster architecture or know what that means or how to use it. Um, similarly, when you get into installation, it's not is it doesn't cover the sorts of things I think someone would really need to know. Um, there is a quick start guide, and this the quick start guide has actually got some got some good stuff in it. And then there's an examples and use cases, but even these, there's only a few of them. There's one on monitoring HTTP traffic. There's one on detecting an FTP brute force attack. And then it immediately starts talking about issues with writing scripts with some stats and, and the like. And then we have the frameworks and script reference. So I didn't see that there was a lot here for someone who was just beginning. Like, why would you use this? What does the data look like once you're, you're working with it? Uh, because to me, the, for someone who's new to the, the Zeek project, the core of the project is uh, or consists of the files that get written to disk after you've processed a PCAP or you've watched a live interface. And there's really nothing here about that. So, so it seems to me that there's a big disconnect between the previous uh, set of documentation and what you actually get if you run Zeek for the first time. So that was the, the major goal that I was trying to fix. 
So if we were to see what we have now, let's check that out. Okay. So now if you simply go to uh, docs.zeek.org, you're gonna get redirected to the, um, the new version of the documentation. And uh, by the way, the reason why all of this looks so good is uh, John Seawick. He, he did all the formatting. He took all the material that uh, was written by all of the, the co-authors of this, and he turned it into something that looks beautiful in Read the Docs. So I'd like to thank him for that, because without him, we would have a bunch of, of docs with no uh, nice formatting and ability to present. So when you, you go to the documentation page, you'll see that there's a note about reading the appropriate version, and then there's a little description down here. So if you want to read what we are looking at, we're essentially in the, the Git master branch. Um, we don't have to worry about what that exactly means, but this is the one that you want to, uh, uh, the one that you want to work with. One of the ways you'll know that you're in the new documentation, incidentally, is you'll see a lot more about Zeek logs over here. So just to sort of an, an overview of what we have, we'll start out with a discussion about what is Zeek, uh, why would you use it, the history of the project, and a little bit about the architecture. Um, then we uh, talk about how do you monitor with Zeek? So this was an issue that we would constantly get in uh, chat rooms and, and uh, other public forums. People would say, well, how do I run this? Where do, where do I go? What, um, what can I see depending on where I am? And some people didn't really even understand that uh, Zeek is a network monitor. In other words, it's watching traffic. It's not necessarily something you install on an endpoint. Now you can install it on an endpoint and you can watch traffic to and from that endpoint, um, but some people didn't even quite understand that. I, I remember teaching a class once in Abu Dhabi and a young man in the class, he just, he just kept asking me, uh, where do I install the EXE on the server? He, d he didn't grasp that, that this was something that generally would be hanging off of a network tap or perhaps hanging off of a span port on a switch. Uh, going into a dedicated platform for monitoring, it wasn't uh, uh, you know an executable that you installed on your your Active, Dir uh, Active Directory server. So after we have the the discussion about um, where would you monitor and uh, what would you collect, uh, we talk about how to get started. And uh, Fatima did a, a really nice job here with the installation uh, section, and we have a cluster setup which I believe Christian wrote. Um, or a sheesh, I can't remember, but there's a new section on, on cluster setup. And then we start getting into the material that I think is really the heart of the matter for, for analysts. And this is material on what to do, uh, first of all, what do the logs look like? How do you manipulate them? And then what do they mean? So to take a look at that, for example, um, let's go into the uh, formats section. So the idea that I took with with this part of the logs, or this part of the documentation and looking at log, logs, was I wanted to I wanted people to start with a very um, a very distinct foundation. I want them to sort of start at the very uh, core of what it is to work with network traffic, and for that reason, I would do something like this. So here I have uh, a network trace, and I show people if you were to take a look at this network trace using a fundamental uh, installed in every Linux or Unix distribution uh, tool like TCP dump, this is the traffic we're looking at. So we can see that we have uh, some DNS requests and replies. We have some um, a TCP connection here that closes. You know, it's got a three-way handshake, some data is passed, and then we've got a graceful close. So this is what this traffic looks like. Oh, and actually, we can come over here and check it out. It looks like we've got some HTTP traffic. So this is what it would look like with TCP dump. So if you have any experience at all with networking, you've probably used TCP dump. You've probably looked at individual packets. So you could take a look at this and say, okay, this is a simple trace with a few things that are happening. And it looks like someone visited test my IDS and there was some type of a web interaction and uh, there was a get request and there was a successful HTTP um, 1.1 reply. And I describe what that is if you don't actually know that. So then I say, um, let's make a couple directories. And th by the way, this is the sort of thing that if you had the PCAPs, you could follow along. Now, I didn't provide the PCAPs with the this version of the documentation. 
um, partly because most of this traffic is out of my home network. And uh, as anyone who's worked with network traffic knows, uh, it's almost impossible to sanitize real live traffic without letting something slip. And so um, I maybe in a few in the future, you know, maybe for a future revision when we can say build out a lab and have um, a lot of traffic to work with that we know is completely artificial, which incidentally starts to not as be as fun, but you know, that's the trade-off we have to make. But you know, you could potentially have your own PCAP and you could follow along and make the directories and analyze and see what you get. And that was one of the goals we had uh, with the project as well, was that I didn't try to hide anything. So you wouldn't wonder, well, how did that file come come to be? And I'd say, well, here, you know, here's here's how it happened. So then I show, okay, if we're gonna run Zeek against this this PCAP, what do we get? And as you can see, we get a con log, DNS, files, HTTP, and a packet filter log. And then just simply using a cat command, I show you what's in each one of these files. So there's each file in turn. Now, um, you might be wondering, well, why didn't I put this into a sim? You know, why didn't I put it into Splunk or Humio or Elastic or whatever? Um, I didn't want to assume that the user had any of those tools at their disposal. Um, if you're working with Zeek, anyone will have access to the text space logs, unless you're, you know, potentially trapped into some kind of uh, vendor supplied application that doesn't give you the actual Zeek logs. Um, but I was hoping that, you know, in this case, this is the, the open source Zeek project. If you have access to the source code and you, or, you know, a package that's derived from the source code, like we provide at, at Zeek.org, you could replicate this sort of analysis. So the typical or the, the traditional way that someone would take a look at Zeek logs without a SIM or anything would be to use uh, command line tools. And if they wanted to look at various fields, they might use something like awk. This was the very first thing I ever did with, with Zeek. It's the very first thing that I did with the Zeek class I mentioned at the beginning of the call. So I wanted to show what that looked like. Now, uh, I don't know too many people who still do this because we have a lot more tools that are available these days, but I wanted to show you this is something you could do if you were a, a master with a set awk and grep. But um, we now have tools like ZCut that come uh, packaged with the, uh, the application so that you could take one of those logs, for example, the DNS log, and you could pipe it through to ZCut and you would get an output that looks like this. And using ZCut, you could select which field that you'd want to see to get custom output that just shows you the originating host IP address, the um, query, and any response that came back. And I show you some more how to do stuff with that, redirection, and so forth. And you could, I also show how if, if you're using um, Zeek logs that are gzip encoded, here's how they can be processed. So that's all pretty simple. Um, but a lot of us these days are using JSON logs and I use JSON for everything um, because I like the fact that it's, it's essentially self-documenting. When you're dealing with Zeek logs that are in the uh, TSV format, the, you can figure out what the fields mean by looking at the header of, of the file. But with JSON format, essentially every value has a description of what it is. And that makes it so much easier to work with in my opinion. The logs are a little bit larger, but um, if you're working with them in a text-based format like this, it just is so much easier. So I wanted to show you what, uh, first of all, how to generate those JSON logs if you needed to do it by hand. And then secondly, what those logs look like. And so I show you the same, just for the same traffic, here's what the logs look like. And then I show you how to use JQ to look at uh, those logs. And this tends to be the, the system that I use for the remainder of the documentation when I'm looking at Zeek logs is I'll pipe it into JQ and I'll manipulate it. So here's, for example, what the DNS log looks like. And to me, this is just, this is just so much easier for a new person to read. So you're, you're, you have your timestamp, the UID, which is the key to pretty much all, all Zeek usage, your IPs and ports, protocols, the query for the DNS request, and so forth. And then I give you some information on how to use JQ, um, whatever. So. I hope that this is a good example of if you were someone who was new to Zeek, you ran it against a PCAP or you ran it against a live interface and suddenly you had these files and you'd say, well, you know, what are these files? What is even in these files? This would provide you an example of, okay, here's how I at least can look at these files and try to make some sense of them. But, you know, that by itself isn't enough. So I'm going to move next to the Zeek log section. But before I do that, I'm gonna to go to the interface and see if there's any 
chat questions or anything. Okay, good. Nothing yet. Okay. All right. So now we're in the Zeke log section. I think this is kind of the heart of the material. Um, when we wrote the new material, we wrote uh, something on the order of 60,000 words, which is like about 300 pages of text. And a big chunk of it, um, probably in the order of 40,000 words or about 200 pages, um, are these new Zeke log descriptions. Um, so what are we dealing with here? Let me start with the con log. Now, you'll notice there are more Zeke log types than, are, than what are listed here. Um, what I tried to do was go for the logs that are most likely to be in your environment and save the other log types for the next iteration of the of the documentation. And I'll talk uh, at the end about what's next for the documentation as well. But let's take a look at one of these examples and see what uh, what you can find now in the documentation. So what I tried to do for each one of these log types was talk to you a little bit about why it exists, um, why you might want to use it. And then I go into a description of, of how to make use of that log. One thing I did not do, however, is I did not uh, go through every field in the log and tell you what it means because that already exists in the documentation. So for example, at the end of every sort of intro section on a log, there'll be a link to um, the other parts of the documentation where you have a full description of what all of the fields are. So that was a, a, a early design design decision was this this wasn't going to just be a duplication because that would be a waste of time and it would be really tough to keep it in sync with the source code because the descriptions of all this um, field value material tends to come from the source code automatically. So it would be silly to reproduce all that. So instead, what I would do is provide examples and talk about uh, fields that might be interesting. So in this ex uh, con log example here, uh, I show you some values for a sample con log. And I show you both the uh, the compact format where it's out in a single line, and I show you the uh, format where it pr prints it all um, one value per line, which is a little bit easier to read. And then, so I, first of all, I just say this is what it is, right? I don't actually tell you anything about it. But then I go through and I say, okay, well, let's take a look at some of this material and try to uh, make sense of it. So for example, um, you see the the timestamp field. And I show you, well, the, you know, the, looking at a timestamp like that, that doesn't, you know, I don't read Unix timestamps. I can't translate them in my head. Um, if you can, by the way, let us know. I'd be interested in hiring you for, for working at Corelight. But I show you here how to use a command line tool date to transfer or to transform it into a UTC format. Um, then uh, this is something that you might be surprised at when you take a look at the documentation. I've already showed uh, an example using TCP dump earlier where I showed a trace and I said, here's how TCP dump renders it. I did something similar for a lot of the log about, or the log types in the documentation. I use other tools that I think carry uh, or, or bring forth material that you might miss just using Zeek. And I do that not to show like Zeek is not complete or whatever, um, I try to show it for two reasons. One, in the real world, nobody just uses one tool to do their job. Um, you know, never mind getting outside of the network and integrating host-based uh, values or third-party threat intelligence or human intelligence or whatever the case is. Even within the network world, we're going to use different uh, tools to take a look at our data. So, well, one day we might be using TCP dump because we're on a constrained system and that's all we have. Another day we might have Wireshark and we open up that. Uh, in another place, we might be uh, connected via SSH, and so we're we're going to use T Shark. So I use a lot of uh, the types of tools that I've used over my, over the years as a as a network security monitoring analyst to try to bring out different uh, flavors from the uh, activity that I'm looking at. So here's an example where I use T Shark, and I am zooming in on uh, one of the frames that's involved, and I uh, highlight certain values, and then I show how they get reflected in the Zeek logs. And here's also an example where I um, I used T-Shark and I showed the output. So we've got the hex on the left and we've got the ASCII on the right. And I show, for example, how um, if you count the bytes of data, you get 77 bytes of application data carried in TCP. And I talk about how that relates to 
um, what was in the uh, the Zeek log um, here, the ridge bytes of 77. So it, it wasn't critical for understanding what's happening here to know that there's 77 bytes of data. But if you wanted to know, for example, how does Zeek count? Like, what does that byte count mean? I go through an example where I show you, like, here are the 77 bytes. You know, here here they are, right? They're the get through the, uh, the end of the accept statement. Um, so you can have some faith. And this to me is a key to any tool that you're using for security purposes or really IT purposes. But if you don't have confidence or if you don't understand how that tool is making its decisions, or if you don't at least appreciate how it's making its decisions, you won't have any confidence in it. So if you can't say that, oh, I understand that this, you know, Zeke here is saying 77 bytes and T Shark is saying 77 bytes, and they're both saying that because they're counting the application layer data and the TCP. Um, uh, and the the data that's carried beyond TCP, then you know you sort of wonder what am I doing? Like how do I how can I be sure of anything? You know, we have this great existential crisis because you don't know how your tools work. Um, this can be very important in a security context if you're worried that your tools are being evaded. So an intruder might be trying to subvert uh, the way your your system works. Uh, but it's also just good from a, a knowledge standpoint so that you have a, a good idea of what it is you're you're working with. I also go through and I talk a little bit about what the con state means. This is a pretty uh, uh, powerful aspect of Zeek. So I, I describe what that means and show how we had a graceful close. So, um, you know, it'll show a certain way in the uh, in the con log. Then I go through and explain what the uh, the other con log entry means and talk about the UID. So I take this approach with, with all of these logs. I, I bring in other forms of data. Um, or data representation, so outside of Zeek. And then I try to explain uh, what, what they mean and how it could potentially be important to you. Um, one, of the, one of the sections that I'm most proud of is the SMB logs. And this to me sort of points, the points to the future of what we should be doing with Zeek or what I hope people would be doing with Zeek. The, the SMB logs, so you know, SMB is server message block. It's the core Windows uh, uh, protocol that's used for communication among different uh, Windows systems, particularly in an uh, Active Directory environment. Uh, Zeek produces many different SMB logs or logs that are associated with SMB. Um, so you've got the straight up SMB logs, you've got SMB underscore command, SMB underscore files, SMB underscore mapping. Uh, but then there's some uh, ancillary logs as well that are generally found in Windows environments. So you've got a, a DCE underscore RPC log. So um, what is that? Distributed computing environment, remote procedure call log. Uh, you've got a Kerberos log. You've got an NTLM, um, PE log, and, and the like. Now, I wanted to provide some explanation of, of how to use these logs because they can really save you if you're looking at um, lateral movement or other sort of east-west traffic in a Windows environment. Uh, the problem is these logs are not only verbose, but they're they're not the easiest logs to deal with. So uh, one of the things I relied upon, or one of the features of Zeek that I relied upon here, were the um, bazaar scripts that um, were created by a gentleman at MITRE and were um, also uh, added to by by some other people, but um, this to me sort of points the way to the way Zeek might be used in the future. You will have logs. Maybe you can interpret them. Maybe you can't. But then potentially there's another layer of logic above them that tries to make sense of them for you. And that's really what the beauty of Bazaar is. And so in order to to work with them, I needed some decent traffic, and I didn't want to have to reinvent the wheel here. I um, it's tough enough to try to understand what, what's going on, but it's even tougher to try to create uh, an interesting environment. So I, luckily I found a, a paper called An Introduction to SMB for Network Security Analysts by Nate Marks that was uh, published um, a little over three years ago. Now, unfortunately the link here is dead. Um, I actually tweeted out, uh, well, actually one of the ways to get to the, to the paper, the original paper is just to go to the GitHub link and then back your way up the tree to find it. Um, maybe we can try to get this fixed to, to point to a, an archive copy or maybe just the, the GitHub a repo version of it. But what I did was I used Nate's traffic because he, he posted his uh, PCAPs into that GitHub repository. And then I used his explanations to try to, try to sort of guide me through what was uh, available in the PCAPs. 
Now, I'm not going to lie here. The paper is actually a little bit tough to follow. Um, I would have structured it a little bit differently, given it some more headers so you could see what's going on in different places. Uh, but for our purposes, it was great. It had um, lots of detail, lots of knowledge, lots of insights, and uh, PCAP to work with. So what I did was I used, um, I used that material as the basis for analyzing um, SMB traffic. And I walked through from sort of a simple example up to a more complicated or more complicated examples. And I showed how each of them would take a look at, uh, how each of them would, would look in Zeek. So for example, if someone were to use a net user command and I have the PCAP here, and incidentally, because these PCAPs are posted on GitHub, you could follow along as well and, and do the same level of analysis. And that is one of the benefits of Zeek is that it does have both uh, real-time applications and it does have uh, forensic applications. So for example, um, here's what the con log looks like. And I talk about, okay, this IP was talking to this IP and uh, Zeek observed uh, service, the following services available and this is what they mean. And I actually had to do some research on this because I'll be honest, I hadn't looked at Windows traffic um, in this respect for a while. <laughs> I'm not a day-to-day -day analyst anymore. Uh, my last job before Coralite was, was as a CISO. So, um, you know, hey, you do what you can. But then I go through and talk about, okay, this is what appeared in the notice log. And this is what I'm talking about with Bazaar. All of these are, are generated by, by Bazaar, which is really uh, wonderful. If you were to take a look at the raw SMB logs, you might not be able to make sense of what's in there. The, the data is there. And that's what's great about Zeek is that the data is there. But trying to understand what it means can be a whole nother um, issue. So Bazaar, in this case, uh, believes that it's seeing some uh, discovery activity, uh, which it has classified in its attack tree. Um, and it's showing where it's coming from and, and so forth. And then I show you um, the individual logs that, that uh, Bazaar used to make those determinations, um, how to find out more information, like what does it mean? Like what is an LSAT, LSAS named pipe? Um, I go through all of that. Here's an example of, uh, I processed what was in the DC RPC log, um, piping it through to the unique command in Linux and show you, you know, here's all the, all the messages that it's <laughs> it's passing. So if you were just to look at this, you'd say, well, you know, y'all don't you don't have any idea if it's if it's normal or not. But there it is. Uh, and then I do the same thing, taking a look at the Kerberos.log and the SMP mapping.log. Um, and then I move on to the next example. So that's uh, that's a good example of what it is I'm working with here when I'm trying to provide uh, some insights into the the logs that Zeke is creating. You have different logs that are created, um, why they might be useful to someone, and uh, how to make sense of it. So I'm gonna take a look again at the chat and see if we have any questions or anything. Let me take a look at the poll. Okay, so this is really interesting. I um, thank you for everyone who answered the poll. 23% uh, of you had just heard of Zeek. 30% of you have about a year experience, 30% one to five years, and 50% five plus years. Um, so that that's good. The people of th those of you that are in the newer part, so that's over half of you. Um, this Zeek documentation is for you. This is why uh, we wrote it, or we, I should say, we rewrote it. And I hope that it's helpful to you. Now, uh, at this point, let me talk about where we're going uh, in the future. So, what we released um, uh, the first week of February is our first iteration. The goal was to get into this new structure and to, to have material out there that is more uh, user-friendly. So I feel like we've, we have um, achieved that goal with this first iteration. Um, the next thing that we're gonna do is we're going to, well, it's sort of two tracks simultaneously. The first one is we're gonna see, do we miss anything obvious? Um, there's, for example, we might wanna have some material in there about how to keep Zeek up to date, you know, how to, how to update it. Um, now you could say, well, shouldn't your package manager take care of that? Yeah, I mean, maybe it should. Um, but I feel like, okay, if this is aimed at a new person, we should probably have some material in there about how to keep Zeek up to date. So that is a section that's not in there right now, but I think we should add. Um, the second thing that we're gonna do is we have to work in two directions simultaneously. We have to work forward and we have to work backwards. The working backwards means, was there anything that is that is really important, even though people didn't really ask for it, but 
we should have that in the documentation. So that's sort of a thoroughness looking backwards to, to you know, old, old features. We also need to look forwards because our goal is to eventually have release of Zeek documentation in lockstep with release of Zeek features. So that when a new feature arrives in the source code and becomes useful or becomes um, available to everyone, then we have documentation about it. And I think that's gonna take a while, but that's one of the goals for this project. So uh, going backwards to make sure we didn't leave out anything important, going forwards to make sure we address new features as they arrive. So that's one project. Um, on a similar note, we want to uh, sort of stand up a real docs team. So uh, I mentioned FreeBSD earlier, I've always uh, respected the way that their docs team runs. I'd like to have something similar so that we have people who keep track of certain areas of the, of the feature set and they can write about it and we have uh, a great process around all of that. Um, so that's looking at the, the project from that perspective. The second, so that, that all has to do with the material as we currently have it. And sort of a stretch goal for all of that would be to be able to, to, to take the material that we have and turn it into a printed book, just like we have with Security Onion. So that's gonna take a little bit more work. Um, putting in the read, read the docs does make it a bit easier, but that it's not just an automatic thing where you just go straight from read the docs into a printed book. But um, I talked to uh, the Security Onion team, they gave me some helpful tips. And I have already published uh, books in the last year during my, my COVID uh, isolation. Uh, that we all experienced. Um, so I'm familiar now with how to go from zero to having both printed and Kindle editions of books. So when the time comes, we're ready for that. I think we'll be able to uh, influence that or implement that. The, uh, the second sort of large category of documentation that I'd like to have is to move beyond what we're calling, you know, this material, the Book of Zeke. I'd like to move to something like Zeke in Action. And the idea behind that would be to to take Zeek and show how it handles various cases. Um, the material that's in the existing documentation does look at traffic you know, that existed and, and happened, but it's all very small. It's little snippets of activity here and there. I'd like to have uh, case-based material. So uh, similar to you, you would find with a capture the flag or some type of forensic challenge and have Zeek uh, data analyzed for each one of those challenges. So you could, uh, use it as a learning material, you know, learning system. Maybe you could use it for internal training uh, in terms of, you know, pr someone has to solve this challenge in order to qualify for um, their next step of their, their development or whatever. Um, incidentally, there was a series of books, I want to say in the early 2000s that um, was, was published by McGraw-Hill called Hacker Challenge, I believe. And I think there were three volumes and I read and reviewed them back in the day. And I really liked how they presented, you know, here's a set of evidence, what do you think happened? And then they'd give you some answers at the end of the chapter. So uh, that's the kind of idea that I would like to have for something like a, a book of Zeke. And again, it would it would be free, uh, hosted at the, at the Read the Docs, but then also we would um, try to have it as some, some type of um, print edition as well. Uh, and then finally, um, I would like to have, and, and so that, that project, hopefully we'll start working on it later this year. Um, I'm not sure exactly how long it'll take, but um, yeah, that's that's the timeline with that one. The third one, and this one we won't get to until I'm assuming next year, just because it's it's another one of these large projects. Um, I haven't figured out exactly what the code word for, for it would be. I think I might call it Zeke and Friends or something like that. Um, but the idea would be to show how Zeke data is used in concert with the other types of data that uh, either is used on the network or is used on the network and the host. So we get, you know, we start to become, you know, a holistic approach because let's let's be honest, nobody simply does their job using Zeek data. If you do, my hat's off to you, but I'm sure even you would like to have access to endpoint data or um, maybe IDS data from Suricata or, you know, other, other sources that someone is likely to interact with. So I, I would like to be able to show how Zeek fits into the larger security um, detection and response ecosystem and, again, publish that and have it available for free on, on, on the, uh, the Zeek Docs website. All right, 
I'm going to pause again and I'm going to see if anyone has any questions. Yeah, does anyone have any questions? I'm not sure if there's a way to ask or put it into chat or. There, there is a way people can um, ask their questions in chat or if you give me just a second, I have turned on that uh, the attendees can also ask to just turn on their uh, microphone and chat. So either way, people are more comfortable with. Uh, there's several ways to ask your questions. Great. Anyone? Well, I hope you uh, enjoy looking at the new documentation. If you are interested, it, let's put it this way. If you have any feedback, comments, requests, whatever, please let us know. There is a uh, Zeke Docs mailing list now, so you can send your requests there. Uh, we have the Zeke community Slack, and there's a documentation channel there. Um, that's a good place if you want to interact with us in real time. Um, we are interested in hearing what you think. It can be anything from you found a typo or you don't understand something to I, you know, you could volunteer that you want to write about uh, activity. Um, you know, if you if, if you want to contribute something like here is some traffic that I interpreted and I hear the Zeke logs and here's my write up for it, we would find a way to make use of that. Now, I will say that um, we have pretty rigorous standards as far as uh, publication quality. And um, I was not aware of how high those standards were until I tried to get some of our material through Robin and he found stuff that I hadn't even, I just totally missed. So we, <laughs> we try to make it as, as, as well written as possible. We're not perfect. Um, uh, professional author is something I do in my off time. Although having been sponsored by Corelight to write a, a, a big chunk of this documentation, uh, I guess I am uh, officially a, a, a professional author by virtue of that. But um, don't worry, whatever you create, we will make sure that it gets transformed into uh, the type of material you would be happy to read and others would be happy to learn from. So, uh, you know, it's a community project and we hope that this is helping to both uh, inform the community, but, ho but hopefully also to uh, make the software more useful to people in the community. All right. Yeah, well, it doesn't sound like we had any questions. So um, I'm going to end my part. Thank you, everyone, for attending. Um, and I look forward to interacting with you with uh, the documentation. And I hope you enjoy reading the documentation. Richard, thank you so much um, for presenting. And we'll do this same webinar again in two weeks. So if you go to Zeke.org under events, you'll be able to register uh, for the one that's a little bit uh, on the US centric time zone. Um, so we'll, we'll be doing we'll be doing that. And also uh, to Richard's point, uh, the docs team is a Zeke project team and um, Richard's got some great ideas. But if you've got ideas, too, that you would like to see, um, you know, the docs team take on, um, please you know, join and let us let us know. You can also go to Zeke.org slash connect. Um, you can sign up through the mailing list there. It's an easy place to see everywhere that you can connect with the community. So uh, with um, with the Slack channel, with um, the docs team, with the other mailing lists, like all of that is, is listed there as well. So if you haven't checked out Zeke.org lately, please uh, pop over there and uh, look through all the different sections. You, you'll see not only the events for this month, but you'll see the ones for next month. And also, just as a reminder, uh, we are planning a hybrid Zeke week in October, providing it is safe to do so. It'll, we'll make that decision in June. So keep, a, you know, mark those dates, the 13th through the 15th of October. Uh, save that on your calendar, because if we don't do it in person, we'll do another virtual uh, Zeke Week. So stay tuned and look for more um, more events like this coming up. Or if you have suggestions for events um, and topics, please let us know um, that as well. And with that, I'll say thank you. Happy Tuesday. And we look forward to uh, hey, Amber. your. Yep. Yeah. Sorry, we got one question in. Do you mind if I answer it? Go ahead. 
Okay, so we had a question. Is it planned to write a similarly good basic introduction for scripting, like do's and don'ts for scripting, which events to use, how to aggregate, et cetera? Um, we do have a new scripting section. So um, I can't, I'm so sorry. I should know who wrote each section. I can't remember. If, I think I can't remember if it was a she. It was a she who wrote the new scripting section. So I believe this is Correct. all new. This whole scripting thing is new that he wrote. Um, and if you know Ashish, he's done tutorials on scripting before for like scripting 101 type material. So I would take a look at the new basic scripting section. And I was just looking at the old version to see if it was in there. And no, this is this is new. Um, so please, uh, if, I hope this will um, be of interest to you, Simon. And, and Simon Ashish wrote this based on um, his tutorials. So he followed um, how he presents his tutorials when he was writing um, this section of the new documentation. So if you're f familiar or you've been to Zeek Week or watched some of the, the training that Ashish has done, um, then this format and the way this is written follows his, his training. So uh, take a look at it and we'd love to get your feedback on it, um, especially if there's something that you were expecting to see in there and didn't, because um, we are going to, like uh, Richard had mentioned, we are going to iterate um, on all of this and, and, and make it better each time around. Um, we'll probably have a couple uh, updates before the next major release, but um, the idea is to have it in sync um, with each release. So um, please take a look at it. Anybody who's interested in scripting and give us, you know, critical feedback um, for that because we can't fix what we don't know. We, you know, we can't fix it if we don't know it, it's broken. So uh, please let us know if it did not meet your expectations. And if there are no other questions, thank you so much. Check out Zeke.org and we will talk to you soon. Thanks again, Richard. Yeah. Thanks, Amber. Thanks everyone.